1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If y'all have a Bible and want to go ahead and turn over there, 1 Corinthians 15. You know, when I pick up the Bible, I do so because I'm looking for answers. Uh, when I open up its pages and read, it's because I want to know uh, what the Bible says about something, what God says about it. And I believe w- with all my heart that the Bible is God's inspired and inerrant, His perfect word to us. It tells us who He is. It reveals to us His character. Uh, it, it tells us uh, about how we were made and why we were made in His image to have a relationship with Him and that the only way to heaven because of sin, the only way of heaven is, is through Jesus Christ. But if I'm completely honest, there are times when I pick up the Bibles looking for answers and I walk away with more questions than I do getting answered. And, uh, and I think I'm not alone in that. Uh, I've noticed over the years that a lot of times when somebody first becomes a Christian or, or when they first get introduced to the Bible, they'll pick up the Bible and start reading and start studying. And the more they study, the more questions they have. And I'll get phone call or a text message or, or, or somebody want to talk for a minute in the hallway about, man, I was, I was reading in the Bible and they got an answer to some of their, to some of their questions, but then they had 10 more questions. And, and the Bible, it causes us, this book causes us to do a lot of pondering. It causes us to do a lot of, a, a lot of thinking. And one of the passages that has really caused me to ponder the most over the years is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 55. It's the first verse of our text for this morning, and in it the Apostle Paul uh, is quoting the prophet Hosea, and he asks two questions. He asks, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now, the context of this passage is it's kind of a taunt of death. It's kind of a a mockery of it. The implication is that, that death is not victorious. And that death does not have a sting. And I read that passage and I come away with some questions because from where we stand this morning, that's not what we see in the human experience. It's just, it's not. From our view, death seems pretty victorious. In fact, death seems pretty inevitable. It seems undefeated. We look around and, and, and those that have, that have lived uh, before us, uh, what, if we're a little bit older, our, our grandparents or our great-grandparents, they're not here anymore because they were defeated with, with death. And we look around at life and we know that it's an inevitable thing that, that we're all going to face behind. And when that hap- leave behind. And when that happens, death leaves a terrible sting for the loved ones of, of those that go on. The first four chapters of the Bible tell us the the basic history of of mankind. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. He puts us here to live. And God's original intent was that we live with him in the Garden of Eden forever, for, for eternity. That we have that fellowship with him. But then sin comes along and it messes up that relationship. And part of the curse of sin, God says, is that, that, that now all mankind will die. And when we get to that fifth chapter of Genesis, it gives us an account of, of Adam's life and his family's life there on after about how the curse affected that. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'll hit a few highlights here. In verse 5 it says, Altogether Adam lived 930 years and then he died. In verse 8, it says that his son Seth, altogether, he lived 912 years, and then he died. In verse 11, it mentions his grandson, Adam's grandson Enosh. It says he lived 905 years, and then he died. His great-grandson, Kenan, in verse, uh, in verse 14, it says he lived 910 years, and then he died. Then in verse 27, we get down to the Methuselah. It says Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. Now, that's the oldest uh, account of any man that we have in recorded history, but eventually death was victorious. It caught up with him, and and when he died, it stung. You see, we read about these people in, in the Bible, and the only difference between them and us is that they lived a lot longer before the flood. After the flood, folks started living a lot less. But even then, when they died, it would have stung their families. It would have stung their loved ones when, when they weren't there anymore. It's kind of hard for us to look back and see or read about people that, that died 6,000 years ago or that died 4,000 years ago and to really feel any sting from that, to feel any pain from that. I don't think I've ever shed a tear reading about Adam's death. 
I, I know I've never shed a tear about reading about Methuselah's, uh, Methuselah's death. But when we read about de- the deaths of people that we know and that we love that are, that are more contemporary to us, there is a sting to that. I, I went to the um, obituary page from Big's Funeral Home this past week. Biggs is, is the closest funeral home that we've got to us. I pulled up their page, and it had several obituaries. And just in the last month, there were four names of people that I knew, four names of people that, that I recognized. The, these are folks that were on our prayer list. We were praying for these people. These are some of them your family members, and, and, and most of them your friends, folks that we knew. Let me mention them. Ra- Raleigh Beecham. Age 84, passed away on April the 24th. The the morning that he passed away, uh, Mr. Raleigh, he's an an elder at the Christian Chapel Church of Christ. My best friend preaches. That morning, me and Kurt were out in the woods waiting for a gobbler to wake up. We're sitting there in the dark, and Kurt's phone buzzed. And before he ever pulled it out of his pocket, he looked over at me and said, it ain't never good when a preacher's phone rings at this time of the morning. I said, no, sir. So without saying a word, I went on and started collecting the stuff because I knew where we were about to go. And when he found out what had happened, it was. Death stings. Mr. Bill Rogerson, 86, passed away on April the 22nd. Mr. Mutt's, uh, Mutt's uncle. Mr. Bill attended church out at Oak Grove where my dad preaches. And uh, he, they had become good friends over the past couple years. And I could tell just in dad talking about preaching his funeral that it took a toll on him. And the reason is because death, it does sting. Miss Joyce Wiggins, 86, passed away on April the 17th. Miss Joyce was the mother of Mr. Keith Wiggins, was talking to him, and he had just called and checked on his mother. It seemed like she was doing good, seemed like she was doing some improving, and then got a call just a little bit later that she had passed away suddenly. And death stings. Or Mr. Gerald Whitehurst, age 74, passed away on April the 16th. Mr. Gerald's untimely death and the the events that had led up to that, it broke the hearts of our whole community, our our whole town, brokenhearted over that. Death stings. You know, there there are even times in life that there are people that we just hear about, that we didn't know them, we've never met them, they might not live anywhere around them, we might not have any connection, but when we hear about their death, it stings. I, I heard about this morning, a few folks have mentioned the 14, 15-year-old young man that got killed in a turkey hunting accident earlier this week. Uh, Matt was mentioning how uh, he had coached against the young man in just a tight-knit community. That death stings. You might have heard about last weekend, uh, the young lady, Samantha Miller, 34-year-old bride who died last Saturday when her wedding was over. Her and her, her brand new husband hopped in a golf cart, took off, and they were hit by a drunk driver. She died in her wedding dress. Or maybe you heard about Ayara uh, Barrett, the two-year-old daughter of an NFL star, that she died last Sunday afternoon when she drowned in her family swimming pool. I've never met those folks. But I tell you what, when I hear about those things happening, that stings. It stings to even hear about it. And its sting is so sharp that it can put a damper on even the greatest days or the greatest celebrations in life. That, that girl that died on her wedding day, her family, think about that. They went from celebrating this girl's big day and, and celebrating her marriage to mourning her death just like that. I, I had a reminder of that the day that Kate was born. Uh, we were reminded of that stark reality. You know, Kate, she, she was our firstborn. She was our oldest. So when she was born, this is like the most exciting thing that ever happens to a guy. You know, he's a parent. This is, this is good stuff. And Fran, when we went to the hospital that day, she ended up having a C-section. And I didn't know anything about this. I'd visited a lot of folks at the hospital, but I didn't know what, what the dad went, you know, did in, in this deal. I'd never been there, obviously. So I go in there, and we're in a room. They take the baby, and they're like, here's your baby. Your wife's fine. Leave. So they put me out in a hallway, and there ain't nobody walking up and down this hallway that I can tell that we just had a kid, you know. And I wanted to tell somebody. And my parents and, like, Fran's parents and family and stuff, they were out in some waiting room. I didn't know where they were. So I was just standing in this hallway, and nobody walks up and down this hallway. So I pulled out. I didn't have a smartphone at the time. I pulled out my dumb phone, and I started calling folks. 
And I was telling them, say, hey, we had a baby, and the baby's good, and the mama's good, and they're sewing her up and doing whatever they do to babies, you know, once babies are born. And I, it was just exciting. And it was like just all this excitement. And I was on the phone with a buddy. I had called several folks, but I was on the buddy, or on the phone with a buddy up in West Virginia. And I was telling him, I said, yeah, man, Kate's born. This is good stuff. I'm a dad. I ain't even got the holder yet, but this is good stuff. You know, it was, I was excited, and I looked up, and I saw somebody walking down the hall. And I, and I recognized them. It was Eric and Kelly Woolard. A lot of you know Eric and Kelly. Eric's the associate minister at Macedonia Christian Church. And his wife, Kelly, uh, we, uh, Fran and I had went to Bible college with them. And about a week before, uh, she had given birth to twins prematurely. The little girl made it, but the little boy didn't. And they were coming back from that little boy's funeral and stopped by the NICU to visit their daughter. And I knew what they were doing, and I knew where they were coming from. And here I was talking about the most exciting thing that had ever happened to us and looked out and saw them coming down the hall. I didn't even say another word to my buddy on the phone. I hung up the phone. And we stood in the hallway, and we cried. And I remember Eric and Kelly, they tried to be excited for us, but you can't hide grief. You can't hide it. There is a sting in death. Even in the most exciting moments in our lives, that sting of death, man, it can, it can remind us of the frailty of life. The Bible asks this question, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? I'll tell you where it is. It's right here. It is in the headlines every day. It's in the obituaries of our local newspaper every day. It's on the prayer list in our bulletin every Sunday. It's in this room this morning. The sting of death is right here, and it is terrible. It is bad, and we hate it. Mr. Jimmy often says during the prayer time, it's not always going to be the other person. One day it's going to be your family. One day it's going to be your loved one. One day it's going to be you. And he's exactly right. Over in, Matt, or excuse me, over in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that to face the judgment. We die, and then we face the judgment. And the day is coming when it's going to be your name that's on the prayer list. The day is coming that it's going to be your name that's in the newspaper and the obituaries. And the day is coming when it's going to be your friends and your family and your loved ones that face that sting of death for you. You are going to die. And that's a certainty. Now, the thing that's uncertain about all of our deaths is we don't know when this is going to happen. Who knows? You might break the record and you might hit 970 years and beat out Methuselah's 969. I doubt it. Maybe we look at something and we look at old age now as somebody that really reached a huge milestone as 100. Maybe you live to be 100. That'd be great. Or maybe you die today in something that was unseen, unforeseen. Because life is fragile and we never know what might happen. The only thing that we can do is get ready to face that day when we stand before Christ in judgment. If you still have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 15, I want to look at that whole passage there. It says, starting in verse 55, it asks these questions. It says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from our standpoint where we're at today, just looking at life, it looks like death is undefeated. It looks like death always wins every single time. But when we read through the pages of the Bible and we come to the New Testament and read about Jesus, we see that when he sent his son to save us from our sins, he allowed Jesus to conquer death and to conquer the grave. After Jesus was crucified, they took his body and they put it in a tomb. And for three days he was dead. He stayed dead. But after that, on the third day, we're told in the scriptures that he raised up and he walked out of that tomb victorious over death and victorious over the grave. And the whole purpose in him doing that was to give us victory, to give us victory over death as well. You see, our whole lives and the judgment that's going to come as soon as we're dead, it all comes down to making one of two decisions. Will I accept victory through Jesus or will I succumb to defeat and succumb to death without it? That's the whole thing. 
our whole lives are based around those two options. I can have victory through Jesus or I can have defeat without it. When we stand before God on judgment, it's going to all come down to which of those two options we, we chose. One of those two things will be the ultimate fate of all of us. If we decide that we're going to go through life without Jesus, if we're going to go through life without Him as our Savior, and we face judgment without Him, then death will be victorious. It'll be victorious over. In fact, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 describes hell, it describes the lake of fire as a second death. So if we go through life without Jesus and we die, the only thing that we've got to look forward to is a second death. And time doesn't numb that one. There's no recovering from that one. Our other option is to accept victory through Jesus. Over in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, the scripture says, For all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Now here's where it starts to get good. Here's where we see that there's a way out. Paul says, he's using this act of baptism, and, and, and baptism is a picture. It's a picture that we get to be a part of as God's painting in our lives. He says when we're baptized in the Christ, we're buried with him in that watery grave. And when we come up out of that water, we get new life. We get to start over again. We get, a, we get a second chance. If we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we're willing to be united with, with him in his death, by his blood, through baptism in his name, we can also be united with him in the resurrection from the dead. Then death has no victory over us. Now, that don't, don't get me wrong, we're still going to die. We're still going to die from this earth. They're still going to put us in a casket. They're still going to put us in a grave. The sting of death will still come and it'll sting those that have that we've left behind, our friends, our loved ones, our family. But because of the hope we have in Jesus, all that's just temporary. That's just a temporary situation. The scripture in the New Testament often describes Christians who have died as simply falling asleep. When somebody falls asleep, what do we expect them to do? They're going to wake back up. And that's how death is described for the Christian. It's a temporary situation, but he's going to raise us back to life. You see, because of Jesus, the sting of death, it's numbed by the hope of heaven. That's why when we come to get, gather around at a funeral and we mourn the loss of a Christian, we mourn the death of a Christian, we're sad that they're gone from here because we're going to miss them. But at the same time, we can come and we can laugh and we can celebrate because we know that they're going to the place that we all want to be. They're going to heaven. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, it says to be absent from the body is to be at home. It's to be present with the Lord. And we, we come and on Sunday mornings, we always do this throughout the week. We do it. We pray for sick folks to get better all the time. I'll tell you what, when we're praying for Christians. When we're praying for those that are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we're praying for them to get better, even if they don't, heaven is not a bad consolation prize. If you've got you to have a consolation prize at heaven, you, you can sign me up for that. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? It's not here. It's not, it's not anywhere around Christ. Death doesn't have victory. Jesus does. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? It's not here. It's not in the church. Because even in death, Jesus gives us, he gives us a reason to have hope. Let me tell you, if, if you're not living for Jesus Christ, you need to change that today. If you've never been united with him in his death through baptism, and also united with him in his life through that, you need to be baptized into Christ today. It, all through the New Testament, we see people that were confronted with these facts. And it wasn't like they were great theologians. It wasn't like they knew everything. It, they didn't have the, the Bible memorized. They knew this simple thing. They had sinned, and Jesus was the solution for it. Because they'd sinned, they deserved death. They deserved damnation. And Jesus is the only way out. And they responded. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, we have 3,000 people that heard the very first gospel sermon, and they came, they were baptized into Christ that, that very day. They didn't understand a whole lot, but what they did know 
is that Jesus was the solution. 2,000 years later, nothing's changed. He's still the only solution to sin. He's still the only cure. If you've never accepted him, but we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation hymn this morning, and we invite you. This is not an invitation from me. It's not an invitation from the church or the leadership here. This is an invitation from Jesus himself. He is inviting you to come and to enter into that relationship with him. Be united with his death, but also be united with his resurrection and have that hope of heaven. If, if you haven't, why don't you come this morning as we stand and sing.